Welcome to Berean. You can just be yourself around here because the rest of us are ourselves. So 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let me intro, kind of cue this up a little bit before we dive in. 1 Timothy was written by a guy who was known in his world as a terrorist. He, he hunted and imprisoned and killed Christians. That was what he did. And then one day he came face to face and he met Jesus. Jesus changed the direction of his life. And rather than terrorizing Christians, he became a spokesperson for the Christian faith and spent the rest of his life planting churches rather than destroying churches. He's now writing a letter to a young pastor, a pastor who he's mentored. He took through a growth process and he mentored him and now he's writing to give him some advice. And he's trying to help to shift this young pastor's mind about a few things, specifically in this passage about making Christ your king instead of cash. And so verse 17 is where we pick up today. He says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Has anyone else realized that money is incredibly unreliable? That it knows how to swim away quicker than it knows how to swim to us? He says their trust should be in who? In God, who richly, I love his choice of words there, who richly gives us all we need for our what? Enjoyment. Okay, so too often when we think about money and when we think about financial freedom, we tend to vilify those who have more than us. Have you seen this in America? Class warfare is common. We look at those on top and we envy what they have and and there's a lot of anger towards those with more. But God says, no, 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 I've given you these resources for your enjoyment. Is it wrong to be rich? No, it's wrong to love money. It's not wrong to have money, it's how you use it. Okay, so our trust should be in God. We learned that last week. We shouldn't be trusting in our money, in our bank account, in our possessions, and in our stuff. But at the beginning of verse 17, there's something that you probably saw that made you realize this verse might not be for you. It says, teach those who are what in this world? Rich. Okay, if I, if I had a poll right now and I said, please raise your hand if you consider yourself rich. Don't do it, but I don't think many hands would go up because I think most of us kind of put ourselves as maybe middle class, maybe upper middle, maybe lower middle, but somewhere middle class. But the reality is a little bit different from our perception. So let me just give you some data to maybe help reality sink in this morning. Do you realize that one out of every two people on planet Earth, about four billion people, live on less than $6.85 a day? You're like, that doesn't even get me a Burger King meal. Okay, so check this one out. 9.2% of people live on less than 215 a day. So this is considered extreme poverty, 9.2%. And tonight, one out of every nine people on planet Earth will go to bed hungry. <laughs> you think, I'm not going to eat my midnight snack. I'm going to be hungry too. No, no, no. Like genuinely hungry, right? Check this out. So this is the comparison. So 50% of people on planet Earth today are living on 685. The average American... The average American lives on $164.55 a day. Now, I know that's staggering. Our teaching team has done the math every which way. Portland County, where Ron's preaching this morning, it's like 120-something. It's a little bit lower, um, but it's, it's on average 164 per person. So if you're doing the math in your head, yeah, this is 24 times more that the average American lives off of than every one out of every two people on planet Earth. So if you believe that you're not rich, you may have a little bit of a warped definition of wealth and of demographics across the world. Is it good to be rich? That's a good question. Is it good to be rich? Well, I'm sure glad that I have enough food to eat today. Right? That's a great question. I'm glad that I have enough resources. But let me put this in perspective. So 
going outside of 2024 and going to more of a timeless look at this, do you realize that kings and queens of old look at us and envy our lifestyle? So kings and queens of old could only imagine having running water in their homes, hot showers, endless supplies of food available 24-7 in a safe storage device in their home, transportation that didn't have four legs, that, that could take you to your destination in speeds they could only dream about, in climate control conditions, by ground or by air if you so choose, the ability to talk with anyone face-to-face -face in the world with a device in your pocket, and medical technology that allows you to live with physical maladies that people used to be crippled with or die from. Royalty has only dreamed of a standard of living that we think is normal. And so, we are rich as Americans, both globally and historically. Have you ever just thought of that concept that literally kings and queens of old are looking at your lifestyle and they're like, boy, I would love to live their lives. Kings and queens of old. And so, my friends, yes, when you look at verse 17, teach those who are rich in this world. Historically, no one has lived this good. And even today on planet Earth, most of the world can only dream of our level of living, of our standard of living, of our wealth. So verse 17 I think it's very much to us. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. Verse 18, tell them, here's what they're to do instead, to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. So we are to take these resources that God has given us and not to feel a sense of shame. You know, this is one of the things today is that often in America we're, we're told to be ashamed at what God has blessed us with and what he has given us. That's not at all the teaching here, not to be ashamed of these things. We are called to leverage these resources for good. Use their money for good. Be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Okay, so again, when you look at the data of our lifestyle and you realize that across the world, 80% of all the resources across the world right now are being consumed by 20% of the people. And in America, that rate is staggering. We're one of the most consuming nations on planet Earth. So, so this is a reality thing, and you think, okay, but Americans are so generous. Thankfully, I mean, at least that offsets it a little bit. We have a high standard of living, but at least we're so generous. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of data on that. During the Great Depression, the average American, what percent do you think the average American gave to those in need, to charities, and to church? During the Great Depression. How many of you remember the Great Depression? No. Five dollars, okay. So what, what percent, what percent do you think of a person's income did they give away during the Great Depression? Okay, it's three percent. Okay, three percent. You say, okay, where are we at now? You ready for this? We're between 1.7 and 2.7 percent. And we have been since the Great Depression. So our grandparents and great-grandparents maybe, depending on your age, during the most economically difficult times gave away more of their income than us. And, and, and you think of it and you're like, what in the world? And so here's then another crazy thing when, when they've dove into the data and say, well, where are people giving their 1.7 to 2.7%? Where's it going? So during the Great Depression, 60 cents of every dollar that was donated went to local churches. Today, it's 29 cents of every dollar that's donated. So there's a lot of causes that people are giving to, but 
it's not a whole lot of money. And so if you think, okay, if, if giving reflects our hearts, what are Americans excited about? They don't seem to be too excited about Jesus. Now, now I know I'm, I'm speaking broadly here because being generous is not just about giving to the church. And we've said from the beginning of this series, this series is not about something the church wants from you. This is something we want for you. Financial freedom, a different way to think about money. So as a kid, I grew up believing that when it came to giving to God, 3% wasn't the standard, Great Depression. 1.7 to 2.7% isn't the standard. I grew up being taught that what was the standard? Some of you that were raised in church, what were you taught? 10%, which is called a tithe. Okay, that's, how many of you were taught that growing up? Okay, that's a significant number of you. So I, for my entire childhood, I was a little entrepreneur and made money and all this stuff. I've told you some of those funny stories, but 10% off the top, I would give to God. Now, I am not patting myself on the back by saying that because I didn't put any thought into it. I, I didn't do it because I thought it was generous. I did it because I thought it was required of me. And what I realize now, and it pains me to say it, is that wasn't generosity. It was an obligation. And believe it or not, that's exactly what God tells us not to do, is to give under obligation. So let me, let me give you a key passage from Scripture on this. First, or 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you have, read this with me, decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or, don't miss this, under compulsion. For God, read this with me, God loves a cheerful giver. Okay, so I didn't have a bad attitude about it as a kid. I just, again, I did it under compulsion. I thought it was required of me. So you may wonder, okay, Justin, I, I think you're going a certain way with this. It sounds like you're not teaching that we should tithe. And the answer is, you're dead right. We don't believe tithing is a biblical concept. So let me break this down to you really briefly, okay? And if this is the first time you're hearing it, don't throw the eggs at me yet. Hold on to them. But here's the deal. In the Jewish world, tithing was the taxation system. So it was not a democracy, it was a theocracy, which meant God was the leader of the nation. As such, he set the tax rate. And you say, okay, so the tax rate was 10%. Actually, it wasn't. So there was one tithe that was a 10% tax that funded the temple system. There was another annual tithe to fund the religious festivals that all Jews participated in. And then every three years, there was a third tithe to fund the welfare system for the poor. So if you want to keep the letter of Old Testament Jewish law and follow biblical tithing, those of you who just math that, you should be giving what percent annually? 23 and a third percent. Or 20% two years in a row in the third year, 30%. So you say, okay, I don't think I've ever been taught to give 23 and a third percent. Well, no, because the modern equivalent, you say, what is the modern equivalent to paying our tithes? You know what the modern equivalent is? Paying our taxes. So if, <laughs> this is getting everyone so excited, isn't it? So if you want to honor biblical tithing, then when IRS comes knocking, you pay them what they're asking for. And when New York State comes knocking, you pay them what they're asking for. And when the school district comes knocking, you pay them what they're asking for. Now, what's funny is Jewish people didn't brag about their tithing because it was mandated. And I don't know that I've met many people in our area who brag about paying their taxes. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to think of a single time where I've had someone told me, you know what I just did yesterday? <laughs> what? I paid my taxes. All of them. Be like, good, so that means you're not going to jail? That does nothing for you. And so tithing was never about generosity. Never. It was always about funding the government and the system that God had set up for the nation. 
So I'll tell you what. I, <laughs> when Annie and I learned this, we were newly married, and it blew our minds. Um, and if you want more data on this and you want a deeper dive, reach out to me. I've written an article on this that's fairly lengthy with a lot of scripture and detail to explain this further. I can recommend a book to you if you want to dig further into this. And, and if you don't believe me, that's fine. I'll help you do some research. But when Annie and I realized that the 10% thing was, was a taxation thing and not a giving thing, not a generosity thing, it blew our minds and then it blew our budget. And so we're like, okay, we're not under obligation to this fixed percent. So what should we do? And we said, well, each year we kind of prepare a budget for our family. We say, well, let's, let's start with what we've been trained to give, and that's 10%. But let's make it a goal every year to bump that up a little bit. And so if we can jump it up just a percent each year in 20 years, we'll be giving away 30%. In 50 years, we'll be giving away 60%. Man, when we're, when we're about to kick the bucket, we'll be living off of maybe 20%, 30% of our income and giving away the rest. It is not because we feel any obligation to do that. It is now every year when we try to give more than the previous year, a higher percent, it is a challenge. Can we live off this? Can we give more away? It is a thrill. It is a joy. And there's been people that we've read about who have inspired us who, by the time they, they retired or were older, they were living off 20% of their income and giving away 80%. Uh, can you imagine how fun that would be? Can you imagine the joy it would be to just have trained ourselves to live off a little and just give away a lot? Uh, we went on a trip down to Georgia, down to Atlanta a few years ago with a group of people. And um, I, I, before we left for this trip, there was a lady in our church, really generous lady. And you'd know her if I, if I said her name because she's always bubbly. She's always laughing and talking and sharing. She's very generous. And what she did before we left for the trip is she slipped an envelope into my hands and it was loaded with money. And she said, this is for your trip. Have fun. I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be a fun trip. So there was one day down in Atlanta that we went to Chick-fil-A three times. <laughs> and our only regret is we didn't go back for a fourth. And each time when everyone got out their wallets to pay, I said, nope, someone's got it. Someone's got it. And I took out the envelope and with someone else's money, I paid. That was so much fun. It is so much fun to spend other people's money. <laughs> but it was a light bulb moment for me, like, holy cow. Everything I have is someone else's money. It's all God's. And I'm meant to be a conduit. I'm meant to live with open hands, not to white knuckle. That is the posture of someone who understands money, who understands the difference between ownership and management, this is the posture, not this. There's an anonymous saying that says, the Dead Sea is the Dead Sea because it continually receives and never gives. 